So in the next few videos, we'll be looking at a field of study called game theory, which is using some of the mathematics from playing games to analyze behaviors of organisms. So game theory has its origins in work by von Neumann and Morgenstern from the 40s, and John Nash from 1951. That's actually the, the person that this movie was about. And so the premise of game theory is that these are non-cooperative or competitive games. So two or more players take actions, but they're not strictly cooperating, they're competing with one another. The assumptions that we make when we're analyzing situations like this is that players are self-interested, so players want to win, they're not trying to help other individuals win. Players behave rationally, so there's the possibility for individuals playing to have a strategy or organisms that are exhibiting certain behaviors to have behaviors that make sense in terms of maximizing their fitness. And finally, there's no communication or bargaining between players. They're acting on their own to um, win if it's a game or to maximize their fitness if we're thinking about biology. So when game theory was originally invented, it was intended for analyzing human economic behavior. So economists were hoping they could better understand the decisions of people and their effects on the economy by envisioning people's decisions as if they were playing games. The so game theory in evolutionary biology, so John Maynard Smith is the biggest name associated with bringing this into biology. And he did this um, with a goal of modeling behavior that depends on other individuals. And the assumptions in the previous slide are met. So players being self-interested, that is met if we think of payoffs from these games as fitness values. And you'll see what I mean by payoffs in a little bit. Players behaving rationally is met if rationality is equivalent or equates to consistency of success over evolutionary time. So if certain behaviors lead to higher fitness consistently and reliably, then the use of those behaviors or the higher fitness of those behaviors, the evolution of those behaviors, is equivalent to players making rational choices to use behaviors that lead to success. And then no communication or bargaining is true because in general animals and plants don't talk much to each other and even in situations where there is communication between animals we can analyze that in terms of strategies that favor individuals. Altruism, kind of truly just helping other individuals, is essentially non-existent in nature. So the assumptions of game theory appear to be met in biological systems so we can use some of the thinking that was developed in game theory to analyze behaviors. So the first scenario we'll look at is a famous game theory scenario called the prisoner's dilemma. So the prisoner's dilemma is the following scenario. Two criminals are captured by the police and they're interrogated because the police don't have enough independent evidence. They're going to re rely on um, testimony. If one of them testifies against the other, he'll be offered a deal in which he would get no jail time and then the other prisoner gets the maximum punishment of, say, 10 years, because there's a witness against him. If both of them testify, they'll both get major charges, they'll both get punishments because they have someone testifying against them, but the person testifying is also guilty, so they would have less credibility in court, and so their testimony would hold less weight, so they'd be capable of generating a smaller punishment. And then if neither prisoner testifies, they both get minor charges, right? The police can only punish them for small time offenses that are kind of ancillary or to the side of the major thing. So the idea is if these two prisoners are put in jail and they have to decide whether they're going to testify or not, and then one of these outcomes is going to occur, what does the prisoner do? So criminals generally can't trust each other and they're being held separately so there's no communication. So each of these two criminals has to make the following choice. Are they going to testify against the other? or are they going to stay quiet? And because they can't communicate with each other, each of these individuals is making this decision on their own, and they're gonna make it rationally based on the expected outcome, based on whether they testify or not. So what is the best strategy for these individuals? So when we think about game theory payoff matrices, we put them in boxes like this. And now let's think on kind of this axis, we're thinking about the decisions of one of the prisoners. They can either testify or they can be quiet. And then the effects of those decisions will depend on what the other prisoner does, who can either testify or be quiet. So let's think about it from kind of this black prisoner's point of view. If this individual testifies and the other person testifies, then their payoff is negative two, right? They get the two-year punishment. 
if they testify and the other person stays quiet, they get no punishment. So from the point of view of this individual, whether if, if they testify, it's better if the other person is silent. If instead they're quiet and the other one testifies, then they'll get the full punishment. If they're quiet and the other person is quiet, then they get this kind of more minor punishment. So given that this person has no idea what this person is going to do, let's analyze each of their decisions. For this person, if the other prisoner testifies, well, he'd be better off testifying, right? Because if the other person's testifying, it's better to testify yourself to get the two years punishment instead of 10. And in fact, even if the other person is quiet, it's better to testify because then you would actually get off totally free instead of the minor charges. And then the same rationale goes for this prisoner here. If they testify, they'll do better if the other person is quiet. They'll do worse if the other person testifies. If they're quiet, they'll do better if the other person is quiet. They'll do worse if the other person testifies. But given that they don't know which of those occur, if the other person testifies, it's better for this prisoner to testify. If the other person is quiet, it is better for this person to testify. So the best for the both of them together, of course, would be for both of them to stay quiet, and they both get a total of one year in jail. That's what would be best for the combination of the two prisoners. But for any of the prisoners individually, as we just saw, it would always be better for them to testify, because that would give them a better result no matter what the other person did. And so the individuals, if they're acting rationally, they would both testify, and you'd get this negative two, negative two result, which is a total of four years in jail. But it's going to drive the system towards this set of behaviors here that's actually not as good overall as if the system was over here. So as a group, it'd be better to be here, but we can actually see individual choices and what's best for individuals are driving them here. And this is actually kind of an interesting example where individual level selection is going to be more powerful than, say, some sort of group selection. So this is the first interesting thing about game theory is that when we analyze the decision-making process of the individuals, we can understand how a system gets to a state which is not as good as it could be and we might expect it to be without thinking about the motivations of individuals. Here's a kind of cartoon example of the prisoner's dilemma, right? So economic crash is psychological. If we just all started spending again, the economy would improve. But of course, someone has to spend first. And of course, if you spend, you go into debt. And this is a lot like recycling, right? If everybody did recycle, the world would be a better place. But why recycle if nobody else recycles? So what we end up with is economic recessions and places where people don't recycle. Right? This is what you get when you have individuals making rational decisions. And then that's obviously a worse result than if everybody was making a different decision. It was better for the group, but not for them individually. If we go back to this, what's the best strategy? Well, for individuals would be to both testify. For the group would be to stay quiet. And we can analyze this further. We can think about sort of implications that arise from this. The prisoner's dilemma is used a lot in economics and psychology studies. So imagine a case in which two people are picked up and where one or both of them are actually innocent. So if you think about two people locked up, innocent person is actually less likely to admit to a crime, right? So if you think about other psychological factors, if you're innocent, you're probably more likely to just stay quiet. And so if we think about two individuals, the innocent person is probably more likely to be the one that stays quiet. A guilty one is maybe more likely to testify because they know that there's evidence. And so what happens in that situation is you get a result like this, where actually the innocent individual is getting the bigger punishment and the guilty individual is getting the more minor punishment. And in fact, the prisoner's dilemma has been used to analyze the justice system and talk about how plea bargaining itself, allowing this choice of testifying or quiet, actually favors the guilty because they'll be more likely to take the deal and testify at the expense of the innocent who would be more likely to stay quiet, go to trial, and not make a deal. So this kind of prisoner's dilemma here is used a lot in psychology studies and in economics, and we will see how a system moves to a state which is worse for everybody than it could be if individuals weren't acting in their own best personal self-interest. So if we analyze this in more detail and think about something more sophisticated, if the interaction is repeated, and this is called the Iterated Prisoner's Dilemma, or IPD, then the situation changes. 
So if individuals have memories, if they can remember what happened last time, then testifying gets punished, right? So maybe the first time they interact, they both testify. Now this individual remembers that the other one testifies, so they'll just keep driving and keeping it there. But if in the first interaction, this individual testifies and this individual is quiet, this individual may realize that, oh, well, if the other person is being quiet, then I could be quiet and we could both do better over here. So if you have memory and repeated interactions, then testifying generally gets punished and being quiet is appreciated. And so in fact, the system can move over to here if you have this iterated prisoner's dilemma with some aspect of memory. But if we think about it, if the system is here, then again, any of the individuals have a motivation to switch to testify to get the lesser punishment. So if cheating is possible and favored, if everybody is nice, what really actually works? Is it staying quiet like everybody else? Or is it testifying and getting this smaller punishment? So there was a kind of simulation of this done back in the late 70s, organized by a guy called Axelrod. And what he did was he set up competition with a bunch of different strategies, kind of in a computer, dealing with each other. So there was one strategy which was to always testify, another strategy which was to always be quiet. There was a strategy called Grim Trigger, which is to be quiet until you are betrayed by your partner, and then you testify um, every single round after that. There was a strategy called Tit for Tat, which is to start off being quiet, and then whatever the opponent did to you in the previous round, you would then follow up with the exact same action. And there were a number of other strategies. And so all these strategies were kind of put into a computer and they competed with each other in an iterated prisoner's dilemma situation. And it turns out the most successful strategies, the ones that had the highest payoff after a number of different rounds, had an element of being nice, so quiet at first was favored over testifying at first. They also were retaliatory, so punishment was available to prevent strategies from being used. They were forgiving, so once they got into testifying, uh, the best strategies had a mechanism to go back to being quiet because that results in a better payoff in general. And they also had to be clear, so strategies that were too complicated where the opposing or the partnering strategy couldn't learn them didn't do very well, so a clear strategy was the best. And it turns out of all the different strategies they tested, the one that actually did the best was this tit-for-tat strategy. If the opponent plays the, the equivalent of testify, then tit-for-tat punishes that and then if the opponent has the ability to switch back, then they can both go to nice. And so if we think about it, this is kind of like what might be an optimal strategy for everyday life, right? It's often is the best to be nice and kind to other people when you're having interactions with them. But if you are always kind, no matter what the other person does to you, then you'll be taken advantage of. You should probably fight back every once in a while to kind of keep your opponent or your partner behaving in a way that doesn't take advantage of you. And so we see this in this theoretical mathematical competition, and then we can actually even see in a common sense term how this makes sense. And when we then go and look at behaviors in nature, we can often see this sort of thing, that animals in social groups often do cooperate, but if they are treated unfairly, they'll often retaliate.